Hello everybody and welcome to this presentation of The Elder Scrolls Lore. Last time around we went into detail about the events of The Elder Scrolls Arena. To recap, Imperial Battle Mage Jaeger Tharn, wielding the infamous Staff of Chaos, banishes Emperor Uriel Septim VII to another dimension. Using his mastery of illusion, Tharn impersonates the Emperor and assumes the throne. He breaks the Staff of Chaos and scatters the fragments across Tamriel. Tharn's apprentice, Rhea Silmane, uncovers the plot and is summarily killed. Sometime later, the hero who would be known as the Eternal Champion escapes the Imperial Dungeon. With the guidance of Rhea Silmane's spirit, they journey the continent and reassemble the Staff of Chaos. With staff in hand, they kill Jaeger Tharn and set the true Emperor free. Now it is time to address some lingering questions. We're also going to examine some of the consequences of the chaotic period of time during which Tharn ruled the Empire, known as the Imperial Simulacrum. Let's start with the burning question, at least on my mind. What happened to the Eternal Champion after the Elder Scrolls Arena? Well, we don't really know. There are absolutely no references to the Eternal Champion's deeds, aside from their quest to defeat Jaeger Tharn, that I could find in any in-game texts. It is possible and would actually make some sense that the Eternal Champion, as an agent of the Emperor, was sent to investigate the death of King Lysandus, kicking off the events of the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. However, there's no actual evidence to support that idea, so it's barely worth considering. The ultimate fate of the Eternal Champion is a complete mystery. Moving on to the Imperial Simulacrum, and some key details which were not apparent from the Champion's perspective. It's time that we introduce Queen Baron Zaya. Her unabridged story is fairly elaborate and far too extensive to be covered in detail at this time. The real Baron Zaya is among the longest books in all of the Elder Scrolls, spanning 12 in-game volumes. For now, we'll have to stick to the essentials. Don't worry, she will show up again in this series. During the time we're talking about, Baron Zaya ruled over Morrowind from the seat of Mornhold. She was married to Symmachus, governor of Morrowind and former general of the Imperial Army, but felt little passion for him. For Baron Zaya, this was a marriage mostly of political convenience, in stark contrast to the trysts of her youth. The two had been trying to have children for some time, unsuccessfully. One day, during one of Symmachus's usual extended absences, Baron Zaya made the acquaintance of a mysterious bard. This uniquely dashing figure known only as Nightingale sang of grand tales of adventure and heroism in such a way that Baron Zaya had never heard. She felt herself inexplicably drawn to him, and the two became very close. Baron Zaya fell for him. Nightingale would then reveal that by working together, the two of them could have everything they ever wanted. In the depths of Mornhold, there lay an artifact of great power, the fabled Horn of Summoning. All they would need to do is retrieve it, and their every desire could be made manifest. Getting past the guards to the ancient depths of the city was no problem for the queen and her companion. In short order, Nightingale found the secret entrance to the hidden shrine he sought. The shrine contained a statue, which held aloft a hammer over an adamantium anvil. Nightingale spoke the required phrase, and the statue came to life. It nodded its head, then smote the anvil with its hammer. The statue crumbled, and the anvil split in two revealing the treasure contained within. It wasn't the Horn of Summoning. Instead, Nightingale pulled a staff from the wreckage. Baron Zaya then realized that she had been deceived. As Nightingale gloated over his victory and laughed at Baron Zaya's foolishness, Symmachus entered the shrine, mere moments too late. Before any motion could be made against him, Nightingale teleported away. The Staff of Chaos was stolen. Symmachus sent secret word to Emperor Uriel Septim VII of the staff's disappearance. Imperial spies were sent to Morrowind to locate the thief, but Nightingale had vanished without a trace. Symmachus was ordered to make every effort to learn of the staff's whereabouts, and to communicate any information to the Imperial battle mage, Jaeger Tharn, who was heading up the investigation. 
time swiftly passed with no signs of Nightingale or the Staff of Chaos. At last, Berenziah gave birth to a son, Helseth. Eight years later, she bore a daughter, Morgaya. Word came soon after that a plot against the Emperor had been uncovered. Jaeger Tharn and his apprentice, Rhea Silmain, were named as the primary conspirators, and had both been killed in the attempt. Over the next few years, the relationship between Morrowind and the Empire slowly deteriorated. Taxes and quotas were sharply raised. Symmachus suspected that this was retaliation for his failure to protect the Staff of Chaos, and made every intention to comply with the demands. He raised the taxes and lengthened working hours for the citizens of Morrowind, and even contributed funds from the crown as well as his own private holdings. Yet the demands continued to increase. The people of Morrowind became restless. In desperation, Symmachus sent Baron Zaya to the Imperial City along with Helseth and Morgaya, now 15 and 8 years old. Helseth, who was the heir of Mornhold, needed to be officially presented to the Emperor anyway. Beyond that, the situation in Morrowind was getting worse. Symmachus felt that his family would be safer in the capital while he focused on keeping the peace at home. They traveled to the Imperial City and went before Septim. Immediately, Baron Zaya knew that something was wrong. The Queen had met many Septims over the course of her life, having known some of them very closely. Baron Zaya had only met Uriel VII on two occasions, yet she felt some vague but intimate familiarity with him. At the same time, he didn't feel like the Septim she had known. He was cold and remote, with none of the dignity that she had come to expect. She then thought of Nightingale, the deception which he had so easily committed, and the feeling she was having. She knew that this Emperor was an imposter, and she felt that it was Nightingale. But how could she be sure? Baron Zaya recounted a story from when Uriel VII was a child. She and Symmachus had dined with the Septims shortly after Uriel's father, Pelagius IV's coronation. She described how they were honored to be the only guests that evening, aside from Uriel's best friend, Justin. She then remarked that she heard Justin had died a short time after this meeting. A great pity. Indeed, was the Emperor's response. I still do not like to speak of him. That settled it. Baron Zion knew that Justin had been an imaginary friend, whom the young Uriel had insisted on having a place setting at every meal. Additionally, despite the typically male name, Justin was a girl. This person sitting on the throne was a fake. Baron Zaya had conclusive proof to herself that Uriel VII had been secretly deposed, and that this was the cause of the strife being laden on Morrowind. But what was she to do with this information? No one would ever believe her. She and her children were alone in the Imperial City, and in more danger than could have possibly been predicted. With the situation in Morrowind getting worse by the day, she couldn't return home. They were trapped. Shortly after her meeting with the False Emperor, Baron Zaya was approached by a messenger. The boy brought an invitation to meet with King Edwir of Wayrest from the province of High Rock. With no options coming to mind, she agreed to the meeting. As she waited in her chambers, Baron Zaya received word from home. There had been a coup. The Imperial Guards in Mornhold turned coat and joined the rebels. The rebel leader was officially recognized by the Empire as the new King of Morrowind. Symmachus was dead. Edwyr arrived, and the pleasantries were short. With little hesitation, the Breton King exclaimed that he knew the Emperor was an imposter and that he needed Baron Zaya's help to expose him. He was desperate and pleaded for her to believe him. Baron Zaya simply had to say that there was no need. She also knew. She was willing to do whatever it took to set things right, and to avenge the father of her children. Edwir had a plan. He was in contact with the spirit of Rhea Silmain, with whom he had been close to in life. Silmain had selected a champion to destroy Tharn, but they were currently languishing in the dungeon of the Imperial Palace. Tharn's attention needed to be diverted in order for the champion to be freed. Baron Zaya would be the diversion. The following day, Baron Zaya was summoned to the palace. 
She met with the false emperor in a secluded parlor, where he revealed himself as Jaeger Tharn, and the person she had known as Nightingale. In his depraved mind, Tharn loved Baron Zaya, and thought she might love him, as she had once loved Nightingale. He courted her while she played hard to get. During this time, Baron Zion managed to obtain a copy of the key to the cell of Silmain's champion, and bribed a guard to have it left where the hero would find it. She also stole brief glances at Tharn's diary, and learned the location of one of the scattered fragments of the Staff of Chaos. With that, Baron Zion's job was done. The champion was free, and had embarked on their quest but there was much more information which could be gained to assist them. Unfortunately, much more would be required of the queen in order to obtain it. Baron Zaya continued to steal glimpses of Tharn's diary whenever possible, relaying the information to Edwir, who could then inform Silmain and her champion. As the champion forged ahead and gathered the fragments, the queen continued to spy on Tharn. By the time she determined the hiding place of the final staff piece, Baron Zaya was six months pregnant with Tharn's child. When the last piece of vital information was obtained, Baron Zaya didn't stick around long. She soon escaped the Imperial City with King Edwir, whom she would later marry. They waited together in Wayrest and prayed for the champion's success. We've learned that the Champion was far from alone in their mission to overthrow Jaeger Tharn. Queen Baron Zaya turned out to be an instrumental part of this story. It was her folly that led to the Staff of Chaos being stolen, allowing for Tharn's rise to power. And the Eternal Champion's quest wouldn't have even been possible without her help. Tharn's reign over Tamriel was a tumultuous time for the Empire. The Imperial Simulacrum lasted an entire decade, and the consequences were far-reaching. We've already covered some of what happened to Morrowind as a direct result of Tharn's action. There was additional strife throughout the Empire during this time that can also be attributed to the influence of the False Emperor. For most of these conflicts would be the takeover of the Battle Spire by Daedric Prince Mehrunes Dagon. It was with Tharn's assistance that the training ground of the Battle Mages was captured by the Daedric Lord. This concerns the story of an Elder Scrolls legend, Battle Spire, so we'll get back to it at another time. Next, there was the previously mentioned Five Years' War, fought between Valenwood and elsewhere during this period. The war started with Khajiit raids on Bosmer Trade Caravan. The subsequent skirmishes between the two nations escalated to the point of several Bosmer villages along the Zylo River being entirely destroyed. Two years into the Five Years' War, Somerset Isle attacked Valenwood as well. This separate conflict would be known as the War of the Blue Divide, and resulted in Valenwood losing control of a few coastal islands. In the north, old grudges and smoldering animosities along the borders of Skyrim, High Rock, and Hammerfell flared into conflict. In the resulting War of Bender Mach, Skyrim conquered many miles of territory from both neighboring provinces. A slave revolt in the lands of House Drez in southern Morwind piled onto the province's already considerable internal struggles. The revolt quickly erupted into war with Black Marsh. Like all of these other conflicts, the Arnesian War was short, but bloody. It's certainly possible that Jaeger Tharn triggered these wars intentionally by some indirect means for reasons of which we are unaware. Possible, but with no evidence to really support it. What is undeniable, however, is that the conflicts would neither have escalated as significantly nor have gone on as long had Uriel VII been there to mediate the situations. The Empire's indifference to these affairs was enough to make what may have been small brush fires erupt into inferno. Not nearly as much blood would have been spilled had there been intervention. When the Imperial Simulacrum was ended and Uriel VII was again in his rightful place as Emperor, much work would be required to repair the damage that Tharn had done. In the aftermath, Baron Zaya chose to abdicate the throne of Mournhold to her uncle, Athen Lethen of House Hlalu. 
It would be another three decades upon Lethen's death that Berenziah would return to Morrowind, her son Helseth assuming the throne. The War of Bender Mach was swiftly ended, but Skyrim held on to its gains. The city-state of Dragonstar was divided into western and eastern sections, each with its own government. Walled off from each other, there is a constant atmosphere of mistrust and fear between the two sides. When the Five Years' War ended, Elsewhere controlled both banks of the contested Zylo River. An attempt was made to negotiate for a return of some of that territory to Valenwood, but an ancient treaty was dredged up to give legitimacy to the Khajiit's claim. Tharn's brief tenure as the ruler of Cyrodiil was a difficult time for Tamriel. Once it was over, however, the Empire under Uriel VII quickly bounced back, and continued on its rise to prosperity. In time, its influence would spread across all of Tamriel, hearkening back to the Golden Age of Tiber Septim. The story, of course, doesn't end here, but this is where we have to stop for now. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you on the next presentation of The Elder Scrolls Lore.